depression is arguably one of the most painful things a person can go through. Life can throw all sorts of tragedies our way, but ones that we eventually recover from. But depression is different. Depression is like a black, bottomless pit. When depression takes over, it feels like it will never end. The darkness consumes us and kills any hope we might have for the future. It saps all the joy out of life and all motivation to keep going. It's like a never-ending movie replays in our head of all our past mistakes, all our past failures, all of the times we embarrassed ourselves, and all of the times we've been hurt or betrayed by others. Maybe the worst part about depression is that it makes us hate ourselves. If you're new here, my name is Roni, and on this channel, I dive deep into human nature to help you become everything you're meant to be by building an authentic life filled with meaning and connection. In this video, we'll talk about what depression really feels like, how it develops, its different causes, and most importantly, how to heal it. I'm not going to sell you some fairy tale that it's going to be easy. If you're in the pit of depression, then you have a long climb ahead of you. I've been there multiple times throughout my life, and although the climb was difficult, it was worth it. So what I am here to tell you is that although it's difficult, it is possible. Now, the thing about depression is that it usually doesn't show up on its own. Depression usually comes along with trauma, attachment issues, anxiety, addiction, loneliness, grief, an underlying illness, and so on and so on. We're going to talk about it all in this video. Depression comes in many forms and can have many different roots. So talking about depression as this one size fits all label just doesn't make sense. Yes, on the surface, the symptoms might look the same, but often depression arises from very different causes, which means that people's path to recovery will also look very different. What I want to do with this video is help you understand where your depression is coming from, and most importantly, to help give you hope that there is a way out of the darkness, a light at the end of the tunnel. Let's begin. So what does depression feel like? The first thing we need to figure out is, are you depressed or is your life just a mess? Are you going through a hard time right now, feeling a little down, or are you really in the throes of a full-on depression? This isn't to minimize anyone's pain, but getting over depression is a very different ball game than getting over a hard time. When tragedy hits, we might be in deep grief, but we don't necessarily hate ourselves. The world hasn't lost all its color. We might be hurting, but that's different than being in the grips of an all-consuming negativity and hopelessness. So with that said, what does real depression look like? For anyone who's never experienced depression, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Depression isn't just being sad. Depression is feeling sad and feeling like you'll never be happy again. I felt weird though, like I'd never be cheerful again. Depression is not being able to enjoy anything in life not being able to get excited about anything. Life seems empty, and the small joys of life just don't exist for you. Then there's the self-loathing, hating yourself so much that you can barely look at yourself in the mirror. This is the internal voice in your head telling you what a worthless excuse for a human you are. It convinces you that this is what others think about you as well, that you're useless and unlovable, that you're just a burden on those around you. This is that internal voice that beats you up and uses any small failure to convince you that there isn't anything good about you. And this is where the self-harm creeps in. That self-hatred can get so intense that you want to hurt yourself. People also self-harm to finally feel something and for some momentary relief. But much of self-harm stems from an underlying anger directed inward towards yourself. Depression is that deep sense of loneliness where you don't only feel alone in the world, but you feel like no one cares about you and no one ever will. Depression makes you sensitive to rejection and cranks your social anxiety way up. It cuts you off from any human connection, which just becomes a feedback loop that makes the loneliness and depression worse. And then there's the physical symptoms. You can think of the physical symptoms as the normal rhythms of your body be completely out of balance. You might sleep all day or you might not be able to sleep at all. You might have no appetite 
or you might be emotionally eating constantly. Often depression makes your head fuzzy, so it's hard to really concentrate on anything. And your physical movements either become restless and agitated or sloppy and slow. And the most dangerous part is feeling like it would be better if you put an end to it altogether. This is a lie. Depression can take over you like a dark spirit whispering in your ear, but you can't let it win. There is a way out of the hell you're in right now. Now, I'm going to walk through the different roots of depression. And if I'm talking about a certain cause that you don't resonate with at all, feel free to skip to the next one. Now, let's talk about depression, meaning, and hope, or a lack thereof. One of the most universal experiences of depression is feeling that there's no meaning to your life, that your actions don't matter. And this lack of meaning makes you spiral into a pit of despair. The thing is, without meaning in our life, we have nothing to strive for. We need meaning in our lives. Like Nietzsche famously said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Meaning is what makes difficult work and hard times bearable because your suffering is in service of something. If you're pointlessly suffering, like Sisyphus rolling his boulder up the hill only to have it fall right back down again, the suffering becomes unbearable. The paradox of our modern world is that although our physical circumstances are drastically better than they were in the past, our depression and nihilism is at an all-time high. Alain de Botton, a modern philosopher and the founder of the School of Life, talks extensively on the problems of the soul in our modern world. Take a look. I grew up in Switzerland, which is possibly, you know, the most, well, along with Norway, the most prosperous country on earth. Many of the problems that exist politically in everywhere else around the world just don't exist. There are no debates about education. There are no problems about hospitals or deficits, etc. And yet, people are not necessarily happy. And this really interests me because for most countries, to get to be like Switzerland is an amazing ambition. I think a prosperous country like Switzerland allows you all kinds of freedoms. Your, your life is free of a lot of encumbrances and difficulties that otherwise exist. But when you grow up in Switzerland, you see even there, there are all sorts of problems. And what are these problems? These problems are broadly speaking in the emotional area. So Switzerland has quite a high suicide rate. It has a very high divorce rate. Um, it has quite high rates of anxiety and depression. Although the first world has been able to dramatically increase the quality of life as compared to third world countries, paradoxically, these prosperous countries have ever increasing levels of depression and anxiety. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl writes, people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. He explains how depression and addiction are directly linked to what he calls an existential vacuum. In other words, if there's nothing to fill that void, then that sense of emptiness will easily fester and grow into a full-blown depression. Viktor Frankl developed the idea of logotherapy, an existential form of therapy that focuses on restoring a person's meaning in life. He developed this idea when he was in the concentration camps during the Holocaust and observed that the ones who were able to survive were the ones who still had hope. These were the people who, although they were suffering tremendously and starving to death, would still help and care for those around them. He saw that no matter how terrible things were, those who chose to remain hopeful were able to bear the unbelievable suffering they were in. Frankel writes, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Now, why is meaning so crucial for a good life? Because meaning is what motivates us to keep going. Without hope for the future, everything in the present seems pointless. One of the hallmarks of depression is a deep pessimism about the future. A person in depression perceives the future as a threatening, meaningless void. In essence, Depression is the inability to construct a future. It isn't simply losing your will to act. It's the experiencing of having no meaningful world to move into. We need meaning and a vision for the future because that is the ultimate source of motivation. Without a meaningful, positive future to strive towards, we literally cut ourselves off 
neurologically speaking, from the major source of positive emotion, dopamine. The dopamine system, when it's operating in a healthy way and not in a cycle of addiction, is activated when we move towards a valued goal. Short-term goals are important and they're what helps get the system going. But it's the long-term goals and the overarching meaning in our life that calibrates the system. When we have a vision for the future, dopamine begins to release also during episodes of sustained effort. Think of studying for a test, doing hard physical labor, or enduring sleepless nights with your newborn. If you perceive all of these actions as meaningless, then you'll experience this effort as pointless suffering. But if studying for a test is getting you closer to the person you want to become, if doing hard physical labor is helping you buy a house for your family, and if sleepless nights with your baby are helping him grow into a healthy human being, all of these actions will be experienced as meaningful, worthwhile, and will be accompanied with healthy levels of dopamine. Frankel sums this up perfectly. In some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. Now, the thing about meaning is, it's not something that just comes to you. Meaning must be pursued. We derive meaning from bearing responsibility, becoming everything we can be, and by being a positive force in the lives of the people around us. Instead of endlessly chasing happiness, we must learn to pursue meaning. Because as Frankel says, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And when we build a meaningful life, happiness follows. But to find meaning in your life, you need to get in touch with who you want to become and what kind of legacy you want to leave in this world. In his book, To Have or To Be, Eric Fromm writes this, man's main task in life is to give birth to himself, to become what he potentially is. The most important product of his effort is his own personality. If we don't engage in this process of giving birth to ourselves and experiencing our own development, then not only do we not grow, but we implode onto ourselves. Irvin Yalom, author of the book Existential Psychotherapy, described the connection between existential guilt and depression. Existential guilt emanates from regret, from an awareness of the unlived life, of the untapped possibilities within one. If you're depressed, this existential guilt completely consumes you. It eats away at you from within, because deep down, you know you're wasting your life away and not living up to your potential. Now let's get into depression, chronic stress, and anxiety. Anxiety disorders and depression are inextricably linked. Often periods of heightened stress and anxiety will lead to a complete crash into a depressive episode. Robert Sapolsky, one of the most brilliant neuroscientists of our time, explains how anxiety usually comes before depression. Most often, the anxiety comes first. One interpretation of this, which is you could think of anxiety as this hyper aroused, frantic, urgent state, like a brush fire, that anxiety is just little flames popping up all over the place. And what depression is about is something responsive. What depression is, is a big old thick blanket that you throw on top of the fire to take the air out of it. Depression as a try to contain the anxiety related agitation by just flattening you out. You can think of anxiety as this hyper aroused state where you're constantly on edge and scanning your environment for potential threats. Even thinking of a mean thing someone said to you the other day can activate that fearful stress response and send you into fight or flight. Neurologically speaking, this looks like an overactive limbic system, specifically the amygdala. This activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is a physiological state of hyper arousal, where your heart is pounding faster, adrenaline and cortisol get released, and your whole body goes into overdrive. The problem with being in this state constantly is that it deactivates the parasympathetic state, otherwise known as rest or digest. You need this mode for your body to heal itself, to experience restorative rest, and for food to be properly digested. That's why people often have stomach problems when they're chronically stressed. This overactive stress system then leads into depression. A lot of what people call burnout is exactly this phenomenon. Your body becomes depleted and shuts down. Anxiety is essentially a state when you're trying to cope with a difficult situation in a million different ways with no success. And depression 
is when you just stop coping. You give up. And the problem is, even if there was finally a way you could cope, once you're depressed, you wouldn't even try. Another thing that Sapolsky mentions is that this cycle of anxiety leading into depression can start running on its own after three to four times. So say you had a major stressor in childhood that led to depression, but you bounce back from it. Then maybe in your 20s, you had another episode. By the third or fourth time this happens, that feedback loop starts to run on its own. This isn't a death sentence, but it does mean that it's crucial to understand that if you're constantly anxious and you don't take care of it when it hits, you might be in for a longer depression down the road. Because anxiety and depression are so closely linked, it's almost impossible to talk about either one of them on its own. So if you're depressed, it's crucial to understand what the major stressors of your life are. What has been the major source of your anxiety in your life? Finding a way to soothe that anxiety instead of ruminating on it and succumbing to it will help you step out of this anxiety-depression cycle. One of the most effective ways to ease your anxiety is through the body. Yes, breathing and mindfulness can be helpful, but I find that if someone is really anxious, those kinds of things only annoy them. It is good to integrate those practices into your life at some point, but usually if you're just getting started, it might be a bit difficult. When I say through the body, I mean working out, getting fit. By sweating and exercising, you can bring your body to a state where it can finally calm down. Physical effort is crucial for the release of endorphins, which are endogenous opioids that your body makes. It's like a natural supply of morphine. And exerting effort can also take you out of that constantly hyper-aroused state. Sometimes it's impossible to step out of anxiety just by doing these mental gymnastics exercises. Yes, cognitive therapies like CBT can help you undo some of those anxious thoughts. But if you're constantly hyper-aroused and feeling wired and tired all the time, it's essential to first change your physiological state and then your mind will follow. If you're not exercising, eating poorly, sitting all day, and your anxiety is through the roof, then exercise is definitely something to start trying right away. Now let's move on to depression and its relation to loneliness and social anxiety. One of the main drivers of depression is a lack of social connection. Whether we like it or not, us humans are inherently social creatures. When we're isolated, our body goes into a chronic stress response. Loneliness literally eats away at us. Loneliness is linked with higher inflammation, higher risk of cognitive decline, and higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And maybe the craziest thing is, when we're socially isolated, our brain structure literally changes and makes us more sensitive to perceived social threats and completely disrupts our ability to read social cues and situations accurately. When we're lonely for long periods of time, we become sensitive to rejection and more and more fearful of other people. So first of all, why does loneliness affect us this way? Because evolutionarily speaking, we are programmed to experience social isolation as a death sentence. For most of human history, being excommunicated from the tribe meant you were on your own, in the wilderness, and your chances of survival were slim. And that internal program still lives within us. Jack Pinksepp, an incredible neuroscientist who studied emotional circuits in the brain, found that the brain areas that are activated by social loss are the same areas that are responsible for pain. Losing someone or being constantly socially isolated is literally painful. He calls this neural circuit the panic system, which at first activates a severe response of separation distress. Think of a baby screaming as he's being torn away from his mother. If that connection isn't repaired, or if you're in a constant state of loneliness and isolation, what follows is a state of despair. In his seminal book, Affective Neuroscience, he writes this, Chronic arousal of the panic system may have long-term psychiatric consequences. The persistent stress of social isolation may eventually contribute to the despair and depression that commonly follow social loss and long-term separation. We'll get into early childhood traumas and attachment issues in the next section, but for now, I want to highlight that constant loneliness changes your entire brain chemistry and makes you feel a sense of painful despair. 
This is how Pangsep describes what happens to your brain chemistry. The cascade of events during the initial protest phase of separation appears to establish the brain conditions for the subsequent despair phase, followed by a depletion of brain norepinephrine, serotonin, and certain dopamine reserves. So whether you had terrible experiences with your parents growing up, or whether you were bullied and become progressively more secluded, these experiences set you up for depression on a neurochemical level. But the important thing to realize here is that you can get out of the state. By creating new healthy relationships and social groups, you can rewire your brain in neurochemistry. The brain is plastic. It takes work, but it is possible. It's said that one of the worst things people can experience is solitary confinement. And when you understand the neurochemistry behind isolation, you can see why. It's one thing to be imprisoned, but it's another thing to be completely cut off from the world. We need to be around other people to keep us sane. At the end of the day, we need the feedback of other people to know if we're properly oriented in the world. Martin Buber, a brilliant philosopher and the author of the book, I Thou, puts it this way. Man wishes to be confirmed in his being by man and wishes to have a presence in the being of the other. Secretly and bashfully, he watches for a yes, which allows him to be and which can come to him only from one human person to another. This does not in any way mean you need to conform or mold yourself into a false self in order to meet others' expectations of you. But it does mean that we need to find a tribe of like-minded souls who can act as a mirror for us, who can support our growth and signal to us when we're getting off track. This might mean letting go of friends who aren't aiming at growth in their own lives and finding new ones that are. But ultimately, we need other people throughout our journey of becoming our authentic selves and realizing our potential. The major problem most lonely people face is that they're paralyzed by social anxiety. They feel alone and desperately wish they had a friend or someone to talk to. But the thing they need most is also the thing they fear most. One of the best strategies for dealing with social anxiety, besides getting yourself out there and overcoming it by mere exposure, is this. When you're interacting with someone, don't focus on yourself. Focus on them. A lot of times what happens to people who are socially anxious is that they are hyper aware of themselves in a social situation and are convinced that they're being awkward or weird and they're sure that other people are put off by them. This hyper focus on themselves only makes their social anxiety worse in the moment. But if you start practicing focusing on the other person, you can completely reverse this anxiety response. Focus on what they're saying and on asking them questions. Try to get to know them instead of obsessing about what they think of you. This is one of the most powerful ways to overcome social anxiety. Also, a general rule is to start making more eye contact and smiling when you interact with people. These simple cues alone will make people react to you in a much more positive and welcoming way. Ultimately, loneliness will only feed into your depression if you let it. If you're in a pit of despair and completely isolated from the world, the first step you must take is to start renewing your relationships with those around you. It's not negotiable. Otherwise, the depression will win. Find a hobby you like doing with others. Get a personal trainer so you have someone to interact with. Invite an old friend for coffee. Go volunteer. Meet up with friends to play video games, not virtually. Even going to therapy once a week allows you to start cultivating a healthy relationship with another person. You have to get yourself out there, no matter how uncomfortable it feels at first, because it's the only way to start recalibrating yourself. To recalibrate your ability to be around other people without being consumed by social anxiety and self-loathing. The neural changes that make you more sensitive to rejection can be reversed, but it requires practice. I'll be making a whole other video on social anxiety because it deserves its own deep dive, but for now, I hope that you'll start taking these small steps to renew your connection with others and the world. Two big contributors to depression are attachment issues and trauma. Attachment and trauma are both huge topics that are each going to get their own video, but for now, let's go through some of the main ways they contribute to depression. The founder of attachment theory, John Bowlby, found that the quality of our early attachment relationships with our parents or caregivers were highly predictive of our mental health 
As adults, he writes, in most forms of depressive disorder, the principal issue about which a person feels helpless is his ability to make and to maintain affectional relationships. The feeling of being helpless in these particular regards can be attributed, I believe, to the experiences he has had in his family of origin. He is likely to have had the bitter experience of never having attained a stable and secure relationship with his parents, despite having made repeated efforts to do so. These early relationships are crucial for our sense of well-being, self-worth, and our confidence that we can create healthy relationships later on. Bowlby talks about how we basically internalize these working models or beliefs about ourselves and others through our early experiences with our parents. If we had positive, loving, responsive parents who cared for us and also gave us the freedom and space to venture out and explore the world, then we'll have an image of ourself as lovable and capable and of others as dependable. What happens if we had abusive or neglectful parents is a whole other story. He may have been told repeatedly how unlovable and or how inadequate and or how incompetent he is. Were he to have had these experiences, they would result in his developing a model of himself as unlovable and unwanted and a model of attachment figures as likely to be unavailable or rejecting or punitive. Maybe you grew up in a hectic household. Maybe your parents were never around. Maybe one parent was depressed or addicted. Maybe your parents got divorced early on. Maybe they fought constantly. Maybe they always criticized you and maybe they were violent. Whatever your upbringing was, these early attachment relationships dramatically shape how we view ourselves, other people, and the world. They affect our ability to emotionally regulate ourselves, to develop healthy relationships with others, and to take risks. When we've had negative experiences with our early attachment figures, we are much more likely to develop depression, anxiety, addiction, and have fragmented, unstable relationships. If this sounds like you, then one of the main things you need to focus on to get out of your depression is healing your attachment wounds. This happens by understanding your early relationship with your parents and what core beliefs you internalized in your childhood that are keeping you down today. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of forgiving yourself and no longer blaming yourself for what you went through as a child. Often we get stuck in that five-year-old way of thinking, which is to assume that if our parents were angry with us or were ignoring us or were constantly fighting between them, then that means that there's something wrong with us, that it's our fault, that we are unlovable. In order to restore that sense of self-worth, it's important to first unpack those implicit negative assumptions you have about yourself and to start rewriting your story from an adult perspective. And ultimately, healing attachment wounds and relearning what healthy, affectionate relationships look like can only happen with another person. It doesn't mean you have to have it all figured out when you meet this person or that they have to be perfect. The key is to find someone who is also seeking growth. Everyone comes with baggage, but by supporting each other, you can both slowly unlearn these negative relational patterns. Now let's get into trauma. Attachment issues and traumatic experiences often overlap, but you can think of trauma as causing the most severe version of insecure attachment. Trauma in early childhood has been constantly linked to depression and to many other emotional and psychological disorders. People who experience severe forms of abuse as children often develop what is today known as complex PTSD. In his book, The Body Keeps the Score, Dr. Bessel writes about his extensive research on individuals who experienced prolonged trauma in childhood. He developed the diagnosis complex PTSD, which is different from the classic PTSD that usually occurs from one dramatic trauma experience. This is what he found. We realized that these patients, whose life stories included repeated trauma, particularly beginning in childhood, suffering from a pattern of symptoms that went beyond the diagnosis of PTSD. Their symptoms were pervasive and involved issues with emotional regulation, self-perception, and interpersonal relationships. For instance, they displayed chronic feelings of guilt and shame, along with issues of self-worth. As these individuals struggled with interpersonal relationships, they veered from promiscuity to total emotional shutdown. 
their self-destructive tendencies and dissociative symptoms were also common. Early childhood trauma can have absolutely devastating consequences. Many people who suffered adverse childhood experiences are later haunted by feelings of guilt, shame, and worthlessness. They often are dissociated from their bodies and engage in self-harm and self-sabotage. They often blame themselves for what happened to them as children and hate themselves as a consequence. On the physical level, people with complex PTSD have a hyperactive stress response. This means they have increased levels of cortisol, which causes inflammation throughout the body. Their limbic system, which you can think of as the primal emotional area of the brain, is constantly overactivated. The limbic system, specifically the amygdala here, is responsible for detecting threats and triggering the body's stress response. People who have been traumatized severely have a hypersensitive amygdala and are constantly scanning for danger, even in situations where there is none. This overactivation can lead to chronic states of anxiety, hypervigilance, and hyperarousal. If that's not enough, they also show a depletion of neurotransmitters that are necessary for joy and motivation. If this sounds like you, I highly recommend reading Dr. Bessel's book. It's one of the best books out there on trauma and how to heal it. Now moving on to depression, personality, and genetics. One of the personality traits that's linked with depression is trait neuroticism. This trait is part of the big five personality traits, which I'll be discussing in greater detail in a future video. For now, let's take a closer look at neuroticism. The simple definition of neuroticism is a heightened sensitivity to negative emotions and the lack of emotional stability. People high in neuroticism often experience negative emotions more frequently, more intensely, and for longer periods of time. There's also a genetic neurochemical reason for that, which we'll get into. Psychologically, people who are high in neuroticism are usually pessimistic, worrisome, and have a negative bias towards the world. They're often more emotionally reactive, which means they can easily get stressed and go into fight or flight. Now, neuroticism can be broken down into two facets, volatility and withdrawal. You can think of volatility as the outward expression of negative emotions, like anger, irritability, and the inability to inhibit emotional responses. People who are high in volatility often experience sudden mood swings and can be easily triggered. Withdrawal, on the other hand, is an inward expression of negative emotion. People high in withdrawal often experience sadness, fear, and depression. And this makes them more likely to withdraw from social interactions and the world in general. Unlike the other causes of depression, personality and genetics are kind of built in. They can't be undone completely, but they can definitely be managed. In general, I believe it's important to know your personality in order to build a lifestyle that's in alignment with who you are. One highly researched genetic component is a serotonin gene called the 5-HTT gene. This gene codes for a serotonin transporter that's responsible for clearing serotonin out of the synapse. People with a serotonin variation of this gene, either one or two copies of the short allele for all the biology nerds out there, had a higher propensity to develop depression and heightened emotional reactivity later on in life. But, and this is the important part, these people were only likely to develop depression if they experienced stressful life events in early childhood. The gene-environment interaction is what led to the depression later on, not the gene alone. Another genetic component associated with neuroticism and heightened emotional reactivity is the COMP gene. This gene codes for an enzyme that clears dopamine out of the prefrontal cortex. Dopamine has all sorts of functions throughout the brain, but in the prefrontal cortex, it's mainly responsible for attention, focus, working memory, and executive functioning. People with a COMP gene that codes for a slow dopamine clearing enzyme have an optimal level of dopamine for focus when they're at baseline. They do their best work when they're relaxed, but when they're stressed out or are in a super dynamic environment, their dopamine increases to the point where they can't concentrate and become stressed and flustered. People with a fast dopamine clearing gene actually need the action and the dynamic environment to focus. That's where they do their best work. So if you have the slow comp gene, you probably have noticed that you do best when you're in calmer environments rather than fast paced, constantly changing ones. 
going back to the personality piece, it's crucial to know where you perform best because if you constantly try to fight your personality, you will just experience endless cycles of stress and burnout. It's like the famous Albert Einstein quote, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Now on to depression, addiction, and withdrawal. A huge driver of depression is being in the grips of a life-wrenching addiction. What an addiction does is put you in a constant cycle of craving the drug, getting high on the drug, and withdrawing from the drug. The horrible part of addiction is that whenever you use a drug to feel better and self-medicate, you just end up feeling worse once the high is over. So by a certain point, you feel like you need to go back to the drug just to feel normal. Addiction doesn't have to be a drug per se. It can also be sex, gambling, shopping, self-harming, and so on. Whatever your drug of choice is, the cycle of addiction will eat away at you and will ensure that you're in a constant state of depression and agitation. What happens in the brain when you're addicted is that you get a massive dopamine boost from the high, but once it's over, your dopamine levels drop below baseline, making you feel absolutely terrible. It puts you in a state called anhedonia, which basically means the inability to feel pleasure or enjoy anything. Anna Lemke wrote an excellent book about this called Dopamine Nation. Here she is on the Huberman podcast explaining how addiction destroys our dopamine system. What happens right after I do something that is really pleasurable and releases a lot of dopamine is, again, my brain is going to immediately compensate by down-regulating my own dopamine receptors, my own dopamine transmission to compensate for that, okay? And that's that come down or the hangover, or that after effect, that moment of wanting to do it more. You know, if I just wait for that feeling to pass, then my dopamine will re-regulate itself and I'll go back to whatever my chronic baseline is. But if I don't wait, and here's really the key, if I keep indulging again and again and again, ultimately, I have, I have so much on the pain side, right, that I've essentially reset my brain to what we call like an anhedonic or lacking in joy type of state, which is a dopamine deficit state. So that's really the, the, the way in which pain can become the main driver is because I've indulged so much in these high reward behaviors or substances that my brain has had to compensate by way down regulating my own dopamine such that even when I'm not doing that drug, I'm in a dopamine deficit state, which is akin to a clinical depression. I, I have anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and a lot of mental preoccupation with using again or getting the drug. And so th that's the piece there. There's the single use, which easily passes, but it's the chronic use that can then reset really our dopamine thresholds. And then nothing is enjoyable, mm -hmm. right? That Then everything sort of pales in comparison to this one drug that I want to keep doing. I've been there. And when you're in withdrawal, it feels like you're in a black hole and will never feel happy ever again. The harder the drug, the more severe this pattern is. But the crucial point is that the dopamine system can recover and go back to baseline. The dopamine system returns to baseline usually around four weeks, and it might take longer the harder the drug and the longer you've been using. But once that dopamine system returns to baseline, you can start enjoying life again. You can start feeling joy and pleasure again. And another important component here is that the addiction is no longer hijacking your motivation circuits. When you're in the cycle of addiction, the only motivation you have is chasing that next high and nothing else matters to you. But when you recover, all of a sudden your motivation to grow and develop yourself comes back online. Recovery is hard, but it's absolutely necessary if you want to be free of your depression and start enjoying life again. Now let's talk about healing from depression. First of all, I want to preface this by saying that I know that when you're deep in depression, any advice on how to get out of it will sound annoying and useless. But the thing is, Healing from depression is a gradual process, and it requires that you start making small changes towards a healthier life. Eventually, these things build up and create a positive feedback loop, all on their own. The first key to healing depression is finding meaning and purpose. Without a vision for the future, the present can feel unbearable. Meaning provides direction, hope, and a reason to keep going, even when things feel difficult. Having a life vision a purpose can recalibrate your dopamine system, which is responsible for motivation and reward. 
It gives you something to strive towards, pulling you out of the pit of despair by connecting your present actions to a brighter future. Start by thinking about what kind of life you want to create. What kind of person do you want to be? What legacy do you want to leave? When you can connect your daily actions to a greater purpose, it becomes easier to bear the difficulties that life inevitably brings. Healing from depression also requires structure. A regular, disciplined routine is essential for stabilizing your mind and body. This means waking up at the same time, eating balanced meals, and moving your body. This step is crucial because depression often throws our natural rhythms out of whack, making us stay up late, avoid exercise, skip meals, or binge eat. If you're not getting enough sleep or eating junk, your physical and mental health will necessarily suffer. But by implementing a healthy routine, your body and mind will start feeling better. One of the most effective ways to heal from depression is through physical exercise. Exercise naturally increases serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins, all of which are crucial for boosting your mood and giving you energy. If you're a slob, overweight, and physically weak, this will directly affect how you feel about yourself. Not only does regular physical activity help you feel better emotionally, but it also improves your physical health, which gives you a sense of accomplishment and helps you gain self-confidence and self-respect. If you don't know where to get started, start with short walks outside. If you're really out of shape, get a personal trainer who will keep you accountable and can help you build your fitness gradually. Exercise is one of the most powerful tools to pull yourself out of the depths of depression, so don't skip it. Social connection is crucial for healing depression. Even small interactions with others can help you reconnect with humanity. As Phil Stutz says, even having a simple cup of coffee with someone can remind you that you're not alone. Human connection helps us feel seen, heard, and valued. If you're feeling isolated, start by reaching out to someone you trust, a friend, a family member, or even a therapist. Building meaningful connections can feel daunting when you're depressed, but remember that loneliness only deepens their depression. Taking small steps to rebuild your social life like joining a group activity or meeting someone for a walk, can start to reverse the cycle of isolation. Part of healing is recognizing who drains your energy and makes your depression worse. You need to remove toxic people from your life. These are the individuals who constantly criticize you, bring negativity into your space, or make you feel worse about yourself. It's important to surround yourself with people who support your growth not those who keep you stuck in self-loathing and despair. Setting boundaries with toxic people and building relationships with those who bring positivity and encouragement is crucial for long-term recovery. One of the hardest parts of healing from depression is letting go of self-hatred. Depression often brings a lot of self-blame, focusing on past mistakes, failures, and regrets. But in order to move forward, you need to forgive yourself. Holding on to guilt and shame will keep you trapped in the cycle of depression. Self-compassion is key here. Understand that everyone makes mistakes and no one is perfect. You are not your past mistakes and you deserve forgiveness just as much as anyone else does. Learning to be kinder to yourself is a critical step in your healing journey. For many people, depression is linked to unresolved trauma. Healing trauma starts with connecting to your body and developing interoception, the awareness of the physical sensations inside your body. Trauma can leave us disconnected from our own bodies, and by tuning back in, we can begin to heal. Therapies like somatic experiencing, EMDR, and trauma-informed yoga can help release the trauma stored in your body. Healing trauma isn't just about talking it out. It's about reconnecting to yourself on a physical and emotional level. Meditation is another powerful tool for healing depression. Meditation helps calm the mind, improve focus, and reduce the intensity of negative thoughts. It's a practice that teaches you to observe your thoughts without getting consumed by them. By practicing mindfulness, you can learn to distance yourself from the constant stream of negative self-talk that often accompanies depression. If you're new to meditation, start with just a few minutes a day. Over time, meditation can help you cultivate a sense of peace and groundedness even during difficult moments. Finally, one of the deepest ways to heal from depression 
is through a connection to something greater than yourself, whether that's religion, spirituality, or a sense of the universe's larger order. Religion and spirituality provide meaning, hope, and a connection to the transcendent. By letting go of nihilism and believing that your actions have consequences in the grand scheme of life, you can find hope even in the darkest of times. Faith, whether in a higher power or in life's inherent meaning, gives us something to hold on to when everything else feels uncertain. It offers a sense of belonging and purpose reminding us that we are part of something larger than ourselves. If you enjoyed the video and if you found it helpful, please share your thoughts in the comments. I really want to know what resonated with you. I know depression can feel like it'll never end, but I promise you there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Till next time, guys.